Well, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Michael Genezareth. I've um, uh, been a, a professor of computer science at Stanford. Been um, involved in computational logic my entire professional career, and uh, teaching logic more about the material. It's an introductory course, a basic course, so there are no prerequisites except for two. We assume that people know about sets and set operations. Uh, we also assume they know about symbolic manipulation at the level of uh, introductory algebra. It is the case that we would that there is some value to experience with computational thinking, uh, but it's not actually essential. And in fact, in some ways, experience of computer programming we found has been counterproductive. It seems that students who have not had background in extensive background in computer programming adopt the understand the ideas more readily than people who have who seem to have some trouble unlearning some of the things they've learned in computer programming in order to understand this uh, this, this different paradigm for programming so my what i want to do today is to talk about uh the syllabus we use in the course what we teach and the order in which we teach it uh and i'll talk about i'll give you an integrative example that ties all those pieces together and talk a little bit about our pedagogical infrastructure but I want to start by mentioning my perspective on logic programs as runnable specs, which is, I think, a perspective that most of us share or at least understand. So as I say, computational thinking is not uh, an essential part of the course, but uh, many people do come to the course with uh, some background or some familiarity with computers and their art and their structure architecture. But I want to get everybody on the same page to do that. I talk about the idea of uh, a programmed computer system where we have inputs and outputs, uh, some data structures, and then there's some program that tells the computer what to do with those data structures and how to process the inputs and the outputs. And when programmers write those programs, they typically start with some sort of specification, formal or informal specification, uh, of what the program is supposed to do. That there are some definitions about the application area, some assumptions about that area, some goals that they would like the program to accomplish. And they usually think of the data structures as representing some information about that data structure. And that's what they use in order to generate the program and the data structures. Uh, the alternative that we offer is that one can take those informal specs, or in some cases, formal specs, the informal specs make them formal, and then they become the program itself. So the program, is the, the definitions, assumptions, and goals are the program rather than the code that is generated from those. So this perspective leads to a view of, of logic programs as runnable specs, where the specification is directly executed by the computer rather than having an intervening programming process. Uh, I, I then talk a little bit about how this, this idea of logic programming emerged, and I mentioned John McCarthy and Bob Kowalski and, and the the early days of logic programming. But I'd like to also uh, use this quote from Val Huber, uh, which may some of you may or may not be familiar with. So he, he said, years of experience have taught us that it takes far too long to turn a relatively simple set of requirements into a system that meets the user's needs. If coding code is the problem, the only answer is to eliminate the coding by building systems directly from their specifications. So this is our setup for logic programming, the way we like our students to think about what logic programming is all about. Now, most of the students that come to the course hearing about this are exhilarated and intrigued by the idea and they want to learn more. And our job as teachers is to try to help them understand, well, what exactly is does that mean? How is the specification different from a program? And what technology do we have that can actually make this vision a reality? So let me talk to you, tell you about how we approach that, the syllabus, how we teach the material we teach and in the order in which we teach it. And then as I say, I'll then give you an example of how we tie all those pieces together and illustrate them in, in a practical case. Okay, so our, our, our syllabus breaks down into sort of five different sections, uh, each of which builds upon the ideas uh, developed in a previous section. Uh, so we begin with the notion of data sets, uh, uh, sets of ground atoms, and then we move on to queries and views, which are relations defined over the data in these data sets. 
Then we move on to operations, which are ways of transforming data sets into other data sets. And then finally, we uh, talk about uh, constraints and goals that the programs is, are, are expected to meet. So let me go through each one of these in detail, but they are definitely taught to our students one after another, rather than being tried to be taught all at once. So a data set, as you might imagine from the name, is, is simply a set of ground atoms that kind of describe the state of an application area. Uh, and the facts in the data set are assumed to be true, and something that's not in the data set is assumed to be false. And um, simple example here with a few, few object constants and, and single relation constant P. In dynamic worlds, these data sets actually represent states of the world, or they may represent alternative views of the world in purely static uh, applications. All right, so that's a basic data set is to make people feel comfortable with that as, as a database, except as we treat it as simply a set of sentences that are assumed to be true. Once we've got the basic idea of data sets across, the, the first thing we're gonna do with those data sets is to express queries to extract information from them. And this a query is basically a, 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 a baby step toward views and view definitions, relations, relation definitions. They are flat view definitions. Namely, they are uh, definitions of a head relation directly in terms of the relations in data sets. So there are no intermediate relations at this point. We're directly uh, describing the, um, uh, the view definitions in, in the view relations in terms of the base relations to make things easier. It's essentially the same as select statement in SQL and SQL. And uh, the few reasons for we start this way, one of those is it's very easy to describe the semantics of queries. So uh, simply tell students that an instance of the head of a query um, is an answer to a query if and only if all of the positive subgoals are in the data set and none of the negative subgoals are in the data set. This is relatively intuitive for people uh, to grasp immediately. And, and so what we like to do is then build upon this, but give them some experience with this notion before moving on to more complex notions. So there's a couple of reasons for this. Well, as I say, one is that the semantics is simple, but there's another reason, which is it allows us to do uh, some dis discussion of computational analysis. If we restrict ourselves to data sets and we restrict ourselves to uh, flat queries, then it's very easy to give very precise uh, computational analysis for the execution of those queries. Uh, if we take, say, a, 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 our, the standard definition that I just gave you for that semantics uh, and apply it to uh, do some worst case analysis, uh, we can then get a, 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 a a verifiable, they can look and actually execute the queries and see how much, how many steps it takes. They can get a verifiable understanding of how complex those queries are. And this helps us then to talk about a variety of issues that come up in, in building and designing data sets and writing queries, and then ultimately in writing view definitions that follow. For example, indexing, we can talk about whether we represent a data set as simply a linked list of uh, of, of, of an ordered list of uh, facts or whether we order the facts or whether we actually index the facts on each of the symbols in those in those in those um, data sets, each of which then gives us each of those variations giving us a different computational uh, analysis. So for example, if we don't index uh, this simple query here, uh, that's a end of the fourth uh, computation. But if we do index it, we can decrease that to n cubed uh, and and reap a significant savings in, in uh, execution costs. It also allows us to talk about uh, sub-goal ordering as another example of a design decision when one's writing a query. Do we put the, which order do we write the sub-goals in? Assuming that the execution per engine does not rearrange them, then, or if it do, even if it does rearrange them, what would be the consequence of that? So we might see that putting the sub-goals in one order uh, would lead again to an n to the fourth versus an n cubed. Okay, so in order to drive that home, we then give students exercises to work with writing interesting queries and uh, and and studying what the effects of the various different these various different uh, representational decisions is. So uh, we look at things like Sudoku puzzles. We look at things like map coloring problems or crypt arithmetic problems like uh, this one. Um, and uh, again, we ID here, of course, to assign numbers to these letters to make this a valid arithmetic equation. 
And uh, so then we can take an equate a, a problem like this and turn it into a query uh, by creating a data set. In this case, the data set's trivially the set of all digits. And then we write a query about what would make uh, a correct answer to this. Uh, it's, we have variables S, E, N, D, M, O, R, Y, and they are gonna be assigned, they're gonna be digits uh, such that are all different from each other and that they satisfy some of um, uh, the, the, the arithmetic equation uh, represented by the problem. So you can write it this way. And if you do that, we can do some computational analysis to see how expensive that would be to execute. In this case, there are eight variables, 10 choices. So it's gonna be 10 to the eighth cases that would need to be considered in the worst case if executed in order, if these sub goals are executed in order, uh, which leads to a certain number of unifications, bindings of variables. Uh, and that would take for, for, me, for at least for my computer was greater than a minute to solve the problem written that way. Or they can rewrite that equation, that uh, query by rearranging some of those sub goals, moving the inequality checks up, moving some of the equations up as a result of which uh, that cost of executing that query has decreased somewhat dramatically down to 320,000 cases. And something that took one minute is now going to take um, less than a second. So to give people the idea that these decisions matter and to give them an idea of, of how they should write their queries or if in the ideal, the kinds of optimization that they would hope that their logic programming system would eventually do for them. All right, so that's queries. Once we've done with queries, the next step is to move on to views. And here we going to, we step up from uh, the simple case of flat views written with conjunct conjunctions, possibly negations, and add other logical operators. So we bring in disjunction, um, we bring in recursion at this point, uh, and then also start to talk about um, functional terms, um, either functional terms which are not nested, I have a silly example here that a couple is, a, two people are married to each other, or nested terms like lists. And this is the point at which we introduce append and membership and, and other uh, classical uh, logic programming uh, examples. Uh, the challenge in moving to views, of course, is for people to get comfortable with those functional terms. And uh, But even before that, they need to have a, a some sense of what the semantics of this more complicated language is. The semantics of simple of queries was very simple, but now what is the semantics when one has nested terms and recursion and nested, uh, sorry, um, yeah, yes, nested terms and recursion. So here's where our approach differs from the approach taken in many of the courses in Prolog that I've seen, which is rather than introducing the, the um, imperative, the, I'm sorry, the uh, the um, uh, the in procedural de definition of semantics, we take a declarative approach to introducing semantics. And our approach generally is to start with uh, the semantics of, of views as kind of a generalization of the semantics of queries. Namely, we just keep applying that query rule over and over and over again at, to in order to figure out what the result of a query applied of a complex query applied to a data set is. And basically, this is fixed point semantics. You take every the rule and you apply it again, all the rules and apply again, 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 and again until you run out of things to add to the data set. And uh, so it's a very simple fixed point uh, concept. And most students we found, even those who've not had experience with computers, are quite comfortable with this because it's really not a computational rule, it's a mathematical definition of what the resulting data set should be. That with, given an input data set and a, and a set of view definitions. So it's reasonably under, uh, in, un, to understand and intuitively satisfying for most students that they have very, very few problems with this, people understanding this. It nicely does give the correct semantics for uh, arbitrary queries uh, that are either positive and no, no, no negations or in which negations are applied only to, uh, to uh, base relations, relations in the initial data set. The downside of this fixed point semantics is the results are not unique when one has negated views. And so this is unfortunately the tricky part, the most complex part of, of the course is, of the material is to introduce how we solve that problem. Uh, and we do that by essentially mandating that there not be any recursive cycles in which there's a negated view. So you can't have R defined in terms of not R. 
uh, and we, we eliminate those, the benefit is that it's always possible to take the rules in any rule set and stratify them in such a way that um, every relation, a relation in any stratum is defined only in terms of relations at that stratum and below. And if one of the if one of the sub goals is negated, it has to be defined at um, it must be entirely below. It can't be defined at the same level. The benefit of that is that once one does that, one can use stratified semantics, namely you do fixed point on each stratum and then move up to the next stratum, the next stratum, the next stratum, and so forth. And uh, this solves the original problem of ambiguity with pure fixed point semantics. So this is a little bit complicated and uh, students uh, wonder why we have to go into all this complexity, but nevertheless, they understand pretty easily what's going on here and they can uh, use it to, um, to, to uh, at least intuitively understand what the meaning of, of these queries is. And it nice, of course, does give uh, unique extensions for all programs, even with negated views, so long as they don't have uh, negations and recursive cycles. All right, so that's at this point, we've now told people what views are and what their meaning is, and we haven't said a word about how to execute them, not said a single word about that. So the next step at that point is to talk about interpreters. We talk about how this whole, this idea of computing the result from the bottom up, at least defining it from the bottom up, does not necessarily lead to uh, a great computational rule in general, because it's not uh, it's it's too it's too too expensive to compute all consequences and in in many cases and if there's an infinite set of res of answers then of course it's it's in it's impossible altogether. So then we start to introduce top down interpreters and here's where you bring in unification and SL resolution and issues like tabling and so forth. And we do mention vari variations since the purely depth first. We also mention breadth first and iterative deepening and so forth as alternatives. Although of course we're going to concentrate on the classic. Um, uh, depth first um, approach to to execution, perhaps with tabling. Okay, so at this point in time, they've understood not just what the right answer is, but how to compute the, the right answer effectively. And we spend a lot of time from here on out with exercises. They get a week, more than a week of just doing exercises. Uh, there's some classic problems that uh, tend to stress and to help people to understand how to write um, uh, logic programs like computing subsets of sets and permutations of sets. A very interesting problem that that the students find very interesting is uh, writing the rules for when a a, a board in chess is checkmated. It's it's that it's not simple, and, and yet it's not uh, it's not impossibly hard. And uh, students seem to get like that when they 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 claim it's quite a uh, instructive example. And we do other things like parsing and and uh, satisfiability checking. Uh, to illustrate the power of, of writing things in logic programming um, and, uh, um, and give them a chance to, to get that, get some experience. Here's one other thing we found to be particularly useful, which is we bring in, we give them programs to be look at that other people have written in other, other students or, or some of us have written, uh, namely problems that have bugs in them. Uh, so, you know, for example, Here's the first example here. There, those, those X's and Z's are constants. They're not variables. Classic mistake. Uh, so many times students come to me and say, it's not working. Why is it not working? Well, they didn't have variables. They were lowercase, therefore constants. Uh, or there's uh, uh, unsafe rules or uh, of various different sorts. Or they think that they can use functional terms. Evalu and functional terms will automatically evaluate like A W W times H in this computation of area. I'm not realizing you actually have to get the value before they can use it in the head. So the variety of classic problems, and this has several good uh, consequences. First of all, it 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 it, it, uh, it it tunes them to the kinds of mistakes to have, and therefore they don't tend to make those mistakes as readily. And it also helps them to figure out how to find mistakes, how to debug their programs should they happen to make those mistakes themselves. So this turns out to be very has, has, has very valuable, and the students have responded extremely positively. They've given the negative examples as well as the the positive problems to be solved. Okay, so at this point, we've sort of gone through everything there is in the in a, in um, up through standard views. Here's where we begin to go a little beyond what is uh, I think why everybody agrees with we we need to introduce in a in a logic programming course. We begin to move to some of the things which are of particular interest to me and I think are valuable in logic programming. The first of those is how we uh, model operations that transform data sets to other data sets. Okay, so a data set, remember, is a 
set of ground atoms. And then we use view definitions to compute uh, higher level relations in terms of them. Operations go sideways in this diagram. Namely, they take data sets, converting them to other data sets, which would lead to different uh, view relations and so forth. But we want to talk about how do us want to define operations. And we don't go outside the language, but rather we extend the language to handle this by allowing them to write something, things called operation definitions. Uh, and so an example of that uh, here, I think hopefully we'll carry the, we'll explain what, 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 that, what this means and how it looks. Uh, so it blocks world, you have a stack of blocks, you perform an operation which converts that into another stack of blocks. Obviously the stack of blocks is in logic program is represented as a data set, it's transforming one data set into another. So the um, example here, I hope think will carry the semantics for you of what an operation is. This is defining the operation of unstacking X from Y uh, is defined as the, as the following transition rule. If X is clear and X is on Y, then after the operation is performed, the double arrow, uh, X is no longer on Y and X is on the table and Y is now clear. So they're add lists and delete lists effectively in the operation definition. And an operation definition is that a set of rules uh, that talk about the effects of performing that operation. Uh, so it's, a, I think, relatively straightforward for people to, uh, for, for the students to understand. <laughs> there are a couple of issues that I've mentioned to you folks, just to be clear about this. Uh, one is that uh, operations are, are, updates are all performed simultaneously. So if you have multiple operation definitions, they are all fired at the same time. You compute all of the consequences of the operation and you don't actually change the data set until all those consequences are computed. And then the operation takes place in a big kerchunk and the, and the data set moves to a new data set. So this uh, allows uh, one, for example, to talk about how one might exchange variables without having an intermediate variable. We're here taking all the things P is true of and all the things that Q is true of and reversing them. So now P is true of the things that Q was true of, and Q was true of the things P was true of. So you compute all the things of which P is true, uh, all the new, the, the new Qs and the new Ps, and then you actually perform the change on the data set. So it's simultaneous updates. So it's not like traditional production systems, which happen one rule at a time. And this avoids various race conditions and, uh, that would occur in, with normal production systems. A second thing about this is that uh, these actions can be recursive. So um, an action can lead to another action, which can lead to another action, which, all of which are performed at the same time. Effectively, an action is treated as a set of basic, of basic transitions on the data set. So you have to unwind that all the way down to get all of the basic updates at the same time. And that could be recursive uh, actions mentioning other actions, but they're not actions that come after the, the initial action. They're actions that take place at the same time. Uh, so this is a, <laughs> uh, slightly different from, again, from the way production systems normally would, uh, some production systems operate, but it does give a nice, uh, has a nice clean semantics in terms of the definition of operations of actions as transitions on data sets. Okay, so that is, helps us to talk model update and dynamics in the world. But so far, all we've talked about is how to modify, how, how to describe an application area. So what, what's the, what is the current state of the area? What are the views that one can perform in that? And then how does one transform it into another? But so far, we haven't said yet anything about what a program is supposed to do. We've only sort of said what the world is like. And we can ask questions about it and simulate uh, operations, but we, can't, we haven't yet said what the program is supposed to do. So that's the reason, that's the role of constraints and goals. Constraints, which first of all tells, tells us what the, tells the program, tells us what the program is allowed to do, and goals which tell us what we want it to do. Uh, so we can sort of say that there are some states, if it's purely a static um, application, what states are acceptable, what states are not acceptable, or in the case of a dynamic one, what operations are permissible and what operations are not permissible. And then what kinds of states do we, would we like the program to produce? Um, <laughs> and this is a relatively, this takes, this is expressing information that we haven't ex expressed so far, uh, but it still is a little bit limited. And one can go beyond this and talk about not just what states one wants, for example, but what behaviors one, one wants. Not just I want the state, but I want the sequence of states. And to, for that one, we'd need to go beyond this simple formulation, which we don't do, but we do talk about some formula from formalisms for doing that. We have one ourselves called uh, System Description Language and LPS, uh, Logic Program Production Systems, 
uh, is are, are also more general uh, provide for more general kinds of, of goals and, and constraints. But we don't really go into that too much at this point, uh, uh, just because I'm not comfortable with it yet. All right, uh, then, uh, then there's a question of how does one execute these programs. What's interesting about adding constraints and goals to the picture is it changes the way the execution takes place, the kind of execution. So, so up to this point, we've been talking about um, data sets and views and, and operation definitions, which can be, which are supports question answering and simulation. You tell me what sequence of actions are, I can tell you what the result is, and I can answer questions about that resulting state. That's done by deduction, uh, as in prologue or in our version of prologue, uh, epilogue. And when you take those data sets and actions and produce new data sets and, action, and, and get answers about that. But in order to talk about how we execute programs with constraints and goals, we now need to give some opportunity Give the allow the system to have some make some choices on its own. Just talk about, for example, how a goal might be achieved. And there could be multiple ways that could happen. Or in the case of a static problem, how to satisfy a set of constraints. And this is done primarily by abduction rather than by deduction. And so we have ab, ab we have to take an abductive interpreter, uh, abductive capability, add ad, abductive capability to our interpreter in order to do this. Uh, directly, and so we we talk about extensions to to the interpreters that we've seen so far. Uh, <laughs> okay, so that's the whole that is the that is the set of topics that we cover in the course, and sort of the order in which those topics are covered. In order to make this a little bit less abstract and uh, and more um, to make it more concrete for the students, to give them make, make them give them an intuitive feel for what's going on. As we go along, we tend to use an integrat a, a, one, a, a small number of integrative examples to, uh, to tie all these ideas together and to, to situate them in, in the real world or in at least worlds that they find interesting uh, that are not just, not, not just purely abstract worlds. The one that we found most interesting to do, use for our examples is games. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, games are very nice because the states are well, uh, are, are can be cap captured, the, the states of the games that can be, are usually um, well enough defined that they can be captured as data sets. The rules of the games are fairly precise, unarguable. Are, unarguable. There are, there's a dynamics in the game, there are constraints and goals in the game. So it has all of the pieces uh, that we presented in a nice tidy setting that, that, uh, that students find appealing because it's fun to play games. So an example of this would be uh, a very simple example is tic-tac-toe, where you take a state of the game is captured as a data set here, a ternary relation saying which marks are in which uh, cells, x, x, y coordinates, and which player, there's this thing at the bottom control, which player is turned, which player has uh, is, is supposed to play at this point. And um, so once you've got that, we can also talk about how the game changes as players move in um, in these uh, states, for example, if the player marks cell M N, uh, if Z is the player, then afterward that cell no longer contains a blank B and now contains the the player's mark. So here I think we've got the O player has marked cell one three, so cell one three is no longer blank is now an O and O no longer gets to play. It's now X's turn to play, and so forth. So we see the effects on the data set by uh, by using the the uh, operation definitions. Uh, and then, of course, we have a few definitions of various sorts, defining the uh, properties of states of the world, like is there a row of Xs, is there a row of Os, uh, is, that a, is there a diagonal? Uh, if, they, if any one of those exists, then there's a line, and the game is over if there's a line of one of the marks, or if there's no place to play any further, it's no longer open. And the, uh, we can also supply constraints and goals as these view definitions, what, what um, moves are legal in each state and when, when the, uh, what the goals of the various players happen to be. Okay, so I think this ties together and exemplifies the topics we've seen so far in, um, in, a, uh, in, in, in a way that is, is, is understandable and, and appealing for the, uh, for the students. Uh, now, once we've got this example, of course, we have to give them some, some machinery and that they've been using the machinery all along, but there are a couple of things we do here. I just want to show you a couple, couple of these just to, to crystallize them in your minds as to what we do. 
So first of all, once you've got a game description, what you can do is put that game description into an interpreter, which will then um, allow, first of all, humans to play the game. So let me give you an example of this, and then I will uh, show you some more examples. So here we can have, you know, typical, this, all this, this is an empty program, which we put those rules that I just showed you in and knows how to um, play the game and, uh, and when the game is over and so on and so forth. So that's the first thing we have uh, tools for doing eggs, just simulating the game. But simulating the game is only half of the story because remember, what we're trying to do in logic programs. We want to build a program that achieves its goals. And this isn't achieving goals, it's just checking and simulating. It's kind of doing that deductive part of logic programs that I mentioned. But we also want to do the um, the abductive part. And so the way, way we try to help students understand that is we give them um, uh, interpreters that can take those and actually play the games as well. So let me show you an example of how this works here. Um, let's see, I can I think I can do this, which is, this is, uh, uh, this is a, a simple random game player. It, what it does, it takes a description and plays a move, correct move randomly, but it's not actually achieving the goal. Uh, it's only, it's, it's best attempt at achieving the goal is random. But there's another one in here, which is a little more interesting, namely Minimax. Um, I, oh yeah, here it is. Is that not Minimax? Oh, that is Minimax. So where'd my other guy go? Here it is over here. So now I've got two players here two programs here, one is Minimax and one is this random player. And uh, what we can do with, once we've got these is, one more piece, bear with me, one more piece is we can get a little manager like that last thing we were just looking at. Except that rather than just allowing humans to play, we now have a program that, that we have a, a manager that allows uh, that manages the operation of multiple automated agents. So we can set this up to have random uh, talk to minimax max. Uh, I think they're all up. I think they're all up and running. So then we can let them play the game. And so here you see that uh, that the players are playing by themselves using those specifications we saw earlier. Unfortunately, this is not going to be very interesting for Minimax, but but at least it won't lose the game. Uh, we can try doing that again, see what else happens. And so it uh, wins the game. So this is an example of now the O player winning the game because it's using the specification that it was given without having been anybody programming a tic-tac-toe program, just taking the game description and playing the game correctly. Okay, so uh, that is an example of sort of taking the whole idea of a runnable spec and putting it to work, not just in the case of a single player where the program gets to do everything and knows everything about the world, but actually can even operate in the context of uncertain worlds where there's other players who are doing things that the player does not, uh, cannot predict. Let me get back to you. All right, so uh, there are a variety of different such interpreters that we use. Uh, Minimax, the one I just showed you, and then more complex systems that, that uh, play even play better. Okay, so as I said, games have turned out to be very, we found to be very valuable for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. And so we have a whole variety of games, of several hundred games on, on the website that are all defined, designed, uh, which are all described as, as logic programs of the sort that I just showed you. And students can either look at those or uh, generate those and add to the, to the corpus of, of games. Um, and uh, we use them in, 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 in exercises as well as, as quiz problems and so forth. Uh, and then we also talk about other applications, though the games kind of are, are the thing that is simplest to, to express, but we can use the same technology and we use the same um, uh, language and the same kinds of, of, of interpreters for doing a variety of other things. First of all, business rules. Uh, we have uh, examples, for example, the business of the university is, has rules like what program courses do you have to take in order to graduate and what you have to take prere prerequisites before you can take courses and, and certain are mutually exclusive and so forth. So a whole bunch of rules of that sort, which allow us to uh, build pro build programs which allow which allow people to fill in their their program uh, design their programs interactively so that this satisfies those rules. And then we can do the same thing for laws uh, of various different sorts, like like um, building codes um, when one is designing a building or placing buildings. 
uh, and more recently been working on things like computable contracts insurance. How does one capture all the uh, the rules about it? Of insurance policies, writing them as logic programs rather than writing them in English. And so showing students of this sort, and then we ask students then to do a, an integrative project throughout the quarter uh, where they take a problem like one of these and that their term project is to do one of these problems as a logic program. Okay, uh, how am I doing on time? Well, I'm running quite late, I'm sorry. So there's some pedagogical infrastructure that goes with, I'll just mention briefly, all this material is all online for the students and actually it's for everybody, it's free and open. Um, and that includes a variety of different, the, the online notes, uh, the exercises, interactive exercises and so forth. Uh, there is a, 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 a Swish-like editor, which we call Sierra, uh, which is the main difference is that has all the tools open in different windows that talk to each other, sort of spreadsheet style. Uh, has, that has one nice consequence, which is if you have web pages, uh, you can open a web page and edit the data set and the rules in the, on the web page using Sierra and vice versa. Uh, and so you can have uh, edit arbitrary web pages, not just things within within Sierra. And there's a variety of different uh, pieces of software that are available uh, for uh, for people to use if they want to build standalone applications rather than using it within, our, within Sierra, they want to build their own application, then we can provide them job, JavaScript and, and a couple of other languages, uh, these various different tools. And if anybody wants to read a book, there is a standard, uh, this printed version of the book. Okay, so uh, that's the end of my overview. Uh, 